So you, fin you finished uh, joint structure looking at the skeletal components, connective tissue, uh, so looking at static anatomy, and now we're actually moving into the, um, the joint movements of the uh, pelvic girdle. Let me pull up my pen here real quick. So these are the available motions that you have at the hip. It is a ball and socket joint, so you're going to get movement from all three planes. You're going to get flexion and extension. And you can go through and generally see the amount of range of motion that you should be doing, about 120 degrees of knee flexion, or hip flexion, about 30 degrees. That's quite extreme, more like 15 to 20 degrees of hip extension, um, your abduction, your internal external rotation, and so forth. And this is how you would normally classify hip motion. If you remember at the beginning of the semester, we went through the movements and um, these generally what you were seeing is you were seeing femoral on pelvis motion where the femur was moving and the pelvis itself was stable so hip flexion extension abduction taking away from midline adduction going towards midline and then internal external rotation so you can see here that the um, the pelvis is staying relatively stable and the femur is moving uh, there so you're visually the foot or the knee coming up towards the face in extension the opposite um, this these images are great because it's showing you some of the muscle activity but uh, showing you what is actually uh, being tensed or put on tension what you're stretching when you go in those positions so when you go into hip flexion um, you're putting tension on the glute maximus and the posterior inferior capsule and then here uh, the femoral ligament is being stretched so again to kind of appreciate when you're stretching your hamstrings attempting to stretch your hamstrings what else you're actually stretching in those activities. Here's your frontal plane movement for ab and abduction, and then internal external rotation. And visually what they look like is here. You'll see hip flexion, hip extension. Uh, I have isolated in quotation here because in real life, um, you're really not just moving the femur. Um, everything is moving. Um, so you're, you are getting some component of when you're doing hip flexion or hip extension, some level of uh, anterior posterior pelvic tilt. When you're doing ab and abduction, you're getting some level of hip hiking. And when you're doing internal external rotation, particularly in sport movements, you are not just getting isolated uh, hip movement, but you're also getting pelvic motion as well. So the pelvis, uh, we describe, we're going to go through and look at pelvic motion, and we describe it in the three cardinal plans, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Um, we have your anterior or posterior pelvic tilt that's happening in the sagittal plane. And the frontal plane, we'll call that um, lateral pelvic rotation, or it's, mo it's a lot easier to refer to as hip hike and hip drop. And in the transverse plane, we're usually referring to as right or left uh, uh, motion. So these images are from your book. Um, these are great images because they kind of show like the force couple activities that are happening. Um, we break these into individual slides. So the anterior and posterior pelvic tilt is probably the easiest to, uh, to visualize. I know we brought this up in the previous module with the abdominal aspect, but if you visualize this as a bucket, uh, as your pelvis is a bowl, and if you were to have water come out of the front of the bowl, this would be an anterior pelvic tilt, and if you tilt it backwards and you have water come out of the back, you'd have a posterior pelvic tilt. So that's your sagittal plane movement of either tucking your tail under between your legs for a posterior pelvic tilt, or sticking your butt way up like you're a skunk, like you're going to spray someone for an anterior pelvic tilt. You can kind of see it here again. Here's anterior, here's posterior, and you have your uh, ASIS here. Let me switch to uh, this guy. So you have your ASIS there, and if that drops down, um, that's an anterior pelvic tilt, uh, and your, your butt's kind of going up a little bit, sticking your butt out, and that's your anterior pelvic tilt. Uh, you'll notice over here that, um, let me just, uh, oops. You notice over here that we have um, that when you're doing this pelvic tilt, uh, we'll show in a couple slides here, but what's happening is you're actually getting some lumbar movement, some lumbar spine movement, and hip movement to move the pelvis. Because in order for the pelvis, the femur to stay stable, um, the movement has to be, the yield has to come from somewhere, and we'll see what comes from the spine. But you are, um, when, this, when you're doing an anterior pelvic tilt, this is accomplished by the same muscles that do lumbar extension. So think of your erector spinae muscles and your multifidus muscles, and it's also accomplished by the muscles that do hip flexion, so psoas major iliacus.
So then posterior pelvic tilt is just the reverse. Um, you're going to have the PSIS, or the posterior superior iliac spine, moving yourself down, and you're going to have lumbar flexion and hip extension. So glute max and abdominals are going to help achieve this. Now in the frontal plane, um, we'll call it, it's officially referred to, especially by the book, by lateral pelvic rotation. And you'll either say left or right based on which one's moving down or up. But it's so much easier to refer to as a hip hike. So if you're talking about right hip hike, that means the right hip is going up. If you say left hip hike, the left hip's going up. And then when you're getting a left hip hike, because of the connection, because of the lack of movement at the SI joint, if you're getting a left hip hike because the... Um, because this left hip is moving up, that means at the same time this right side is moving down. And vice versa, if if this is going into a, a, a this hip hike, you're going to get this side drop down. So it's like if you take the steering wheel and you um, you turn it, this is going to go up, this is going to go on, and, and vice versa. So uh, again, I think the hip hike and the hip drop are more commonly used terms. Um, this left lateral pelvic rotation or right lateral pelvic rotation, um, just look at what the ASIS is doing. And um, if it's moving to the left, that means it's moving down. So left lateral pelvic rotation is the same as a right hip hike. It's all saying the same thing, just different aspects. And then if you're looking from a bird's eye view down, um, we're looking at pelvic rotation. So this right pelvic rotation or left pelvic, basically if you turn to your right, um, your right pelvic rotation, if you turn to the left, it's left pelvic rotation. So those are the, those are the description of the movements that we do in the uh, lower extremity or in the pelvis is the sagittal plane, posterior anterior pelvic tilt. These move independently, um, but with these ones are coupled because of the SI joint. Uh, left hip hike is the same as the right hip drop and the right rotation is the right pelvis moving back and the left pelvis moving forward. So we look at this um, complex play between lumbar spine and pelvis and pelvis and hips as is lumbo-pelvic hip complex. And you really, when you look at these interlinked chains, you can't have movement at one without affecting movement at the other. Now you could relatively isolate the hips and you can relatively isolate the lumbar spine, but it's very hard to isolate the pelvis in movement. So if you're moving the pelvis, you are definitely getting some lumbar spine involvement and you're definitely getting some hip involvement. It's, it's, it's impossible to move away from there. And the reason is, is that when you remember our spine, when we have our neutral spine, uh, the base of the spine is the sacrum. And that sacrum is, is sandwiched together between both sides of the pelvis. And because of this bony attachment here at the SI joint, um, especially in the frontal plane and in the transverse plane, so with rotation and uh, hip hike, where the pelvis goes, the sacrum goes. And where the sacrum goes, the spine goes. So you're going to get these coupled movements. So our next few slides is we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at how the uh, pelvic movements affect the spine. So now if we try to isolate pelvic motion and we do an anterior pelvic tilt, it's going to uh, force then, or at least going to accompany lumbar extension. You're going to arch your back. At the same time, it's going to bring the pelvis, the uh, ASIS, the anterior part of the pelvis, it's going to bring that closer to the femur, thus creating hip flexion. Right, so an anterior pelvic tilt is coupled, coupled with lumbar extension. And uh, when we look at now the posterior pelvic tilt, where the pelvis is rotating backwards, that's going to be, that's going to create lumbar flexion. Right, you're going to kind of, you're going to round out the back. And since the ASIS is moving away from, or the anterior part of the pelvis is moving away from, that's the same as creating hip extension. In the frontal plane motion, um, when we do this way here, this is the left hip, this is the left hip hike, or this is right lateral um, uh, pelvic rotation, but again, hip hike is the easier aspect. When we look at this here, when this hip is coming up and then this hip is coming down, this is forcing lumbar flexion. So take a look at that and, and, and think about what type of flexion is creating. It's creating lateral flexion. If this person was standing up, if these pelvis, if these, both these pelvis became level again and we rotated the pitcher, this would be creating left lateral flexion. At the same time, when we look at the angle here, when this person's standing, if we look here, this angle went from, if this is neutral, it went out this way, uh, a, a left hip hike is creating right abduction.
of the hip. And then the opposite is true on the other side. If I do a left hip drop or a right hip hike that's bringing this femur in closer, that's creating adduction at the hip, and this is creating right lateral lumbar flexion. So a lot of things, a lot of moving parts moving with both of these. And then if we continue on and we look at the uh, transverse plane, <coughs> we look at the pelvis, we can say with the internal rotation, external rotation, if the toe is turning in, that's, that's left internal rotation, I'm sorry, right internal rotation, or toe is turning out, but we can keep our foot stable and we can move the pelvis instead with the pelvis moving toward, this would be right pelvic rotation because if this person is standing up, this is the back, this is the front. Um, and since this is turning to its right, this is right pelvic rotation. And if you're keeping your torso stable, if you want to stand up and do this, you can do that. If you look straight ahead and turn your pelvis to the right, like you're seeing in this picture on the right with internal rotation, and you're looking at your left or right leg, um, <clears throat> this is assuming you're picking this foot up off the ground. Right? So this foot's staying stable, you're bringing this pelvis forward. This is creating internal rotation here at the pelvis, um, I'm sorry, at the femur, at the hip, and you're creating right pelvic rotation, and it's creating counterlateral or counter uh, rotation at the lumbar spine opposite. Now, if both feet were on the ground and you try to turn your pelvis, you'd be creating internal rotation on the left, on the right, and external rotation on the opposite side. So it, it flips around right, because the pelvis is rotating to one side. So let's say you're standing up and you turn your pelvis to the left. You're creating left internal rotation at the hip and right external rotation at the hip. And with that left pelvic rotation, you're creating right lumbar um, rotation to the, uh, to, the, to the opposite side of the pelvis. <coughs> so basically now when you start looking at pelvic motion, if you're looking at a posterior pelvic tilt, that's kind of the same as saying hip extension. Or if you say an anterior pelvic tilt, that's kind of saying uh, hip flexion. And if you say an anterior pelvic tilt with hip flexion, you're also creating lumbar extension. Posterior pelvic tilt, you're creating lumbar flexion. So now you're responsible biomechanically and muscularly for all three of these movements. And it happens for the sagittal plane, for the frontal plane, and for the horizontal plane. So well, let me pull up my, uh, my tools here. So uh, if I do a posterior pelvic tilt, that's going to create a lumbar, uh, uh, sorry, hip extension. And it's going to be the same as lumbar flexion. If I do an anterior pelvic tilt, so the pelvis is coming forward, that's going to be the same as hip flexion or lumbar extension. In the frontal plane, if I do a left, I'm sorry, uh, left hip hike, that's the same as a right pelvic drop. So if this is pelvis coming down, that's coming up. This angle is opening up, so it's getting bigger. So that's creating hip abduction, and it's going to create lateral flexion to the left because this is getting closer to that. So that's that cl that side's getting closer. So it's going to be left lumbar lateral flexion. And then if I look from the top view and we look at rotation, if this pelvis uh, comes forward and, I'm, and this foot's fl uh, sped on the ground, that's going to be equivalent of internal pelvic rotation. If this pelvis goes back, because I'm doing left pelvic rotation and this foot's staying on the ground, that's going to be the same as external rotation. So there's a chart um, that is at the end of this lecture and it's in your textbook that shows these coupled movements. That's probably what I would be spending a majority of my time just kind of visualizing and feeling and going through and doing it yourself. Like get up and do all these motions. You should be practicing um, these positions just to kind of experience what that feels like. So going through and looking at this, like sitting down and doing an anterior posterior pelvic tilt and kind of appreciate what's happening here at the hip, what's happening at the lumbar spine. Stand and do this. Do a hip hike in the mirror. Look in the mirror, do this and see what's happening with your femur related to your pelvis and then try to visualize looking down um, and maybe you have someone uh, maybe stay, stay six feet away 
but you uh, look down on someone, you can see uh, what they're doing from the front, from the posterior view, and kind of look at what the foot is doing relative to the torso. Like just see this in action so it's becoming familiar to you than just the, my little laser pointer and drawings on the screen here. So, uh, like I had said at the beginning of the lecture, that it's it's not impossible, but in normal day-to-day -day activities, you are getting a certain level of pelvic, whenever you do any kind of hip movement, you are getting pelvic movement, and you're getting some spinal movement. So there's an expected rhythm that exists between, if you go down and touch your toes, it's not just going to be hip flexion, it's not just going to be posterior pelvic or anterior pelvic tilt or lumbar flexion, it's going to be a combination of all three. Now, depending upon the resources that are available, do you have really tight hamstrings? Do you have tight lower back? Um, you might not be able to get the available motion from all those. Um, but there is a normal equal distribution of responsibility that exists between all three joints and complexes. And so the better that all three are working, or one of the three, um, the less responsibility others are going to pick up. So in this case, because of the tight hamstrings, this woman is getting so much excessive lumbar flexion that she's putting a lot of excess pressure, undue pressure, on these tissues here. And then here, she's got excessive hamstring flexibility and uh, maybe putting too, jamming up too much on the hamstrings here, locking the knees out, and uh, not getting enough of that range of motion. So again, um, equal distribution amongst the aspects, but in the case of our point here is that our expectation is that we'll have um, responsibility from all three of those joints. So the next year is supposed to be a think pair share that we would have done in class, but I do want you to think for a second. Um, if you stand and do a hip hike, which position does a standing leg end up happening? And uh, I'll pause the video here for a second. You can go through and read through these bullet points and see if you can answer these questions on your own. I just realized here that the answer is given to you is this abduction and adduction. But when um, you stand and do a hip hike, uh, let's say you stand on your left leg and you hip and you hike up your right hip, it's going to be creating adduction on the stance leg and a deduction, so a adduction on the, the dangling leg there. And the muscle group that is strengthened, um, and I, you can actually probably do this on your own. Why don't you do it a few times and see what it feels like. If you do this, you would actually start to feel the adductors of your stance leg. So if you're standing on your left leg, this would be glute medius. So here's that chart that I was talking about. Here are your pelvic motions here. And then here are the coupled uh, spine movements and the coupled uh, hip movements, uh, assuming that both feet are on the ground. It's the one from your book. And uh, that's it for this lecture. So make sure you're reviewing page uh, 225 and 228 from the textbook. And then definitely review the um, pelvic and femoral, which you should already, uh, which should be relatively new to you, but not so much. And then the femoral and pelvic motions, which are should be spot on. But more importantly, look at how they're coupled with the, lumbo, with the entire lumbopelvic hip complex.